Kirsten Sandberg. I work at the Weather Channel, now an IBM company. Uh, today I'll be talking about recursive type classes, which we'll get into what exactly that means in a little bit, uh, through a long form example that will hopefully explain things as we go. Um, that being said, I have seen a few other presenters sort of touch on this topic, so hopefully I'll be able to provide my own uh, viewpoint on it. Uh, and just before I start, uh, I wanted to make this presentation as accessible as possible, so we're going to cover some of the basics first and then start building up to uh, our full recursive type class. So uh, first thing we're going to start with is just implicits and specifically implicit values. Implicit values just allow passing of a value without mentioning it at the call site, meaning you de declare an implicit int, ask for that implicit int in the function, and the compiler will automatically look up any implicit int in scope and fill in the value for you. Uh, and then the next is implicit functions. Uh, these allow for transparent transformation of types, meaning if you have this add function with two ints and you have an implicit function in scope that converts a double to an int, if you then try to use that add function with a double, it'll implicitly call that conversion from a double to an int. Of course, in this case, rounding down, and you get four plus one, which is five. So, as you might imagine, type classes are foundational to understanding recursive type classes. Let's cover that next. Uh, type classes enable ad hoc polymorphism. And all that really means is that you can specify functionality for a given class outside the scope of that class. So as an example, Scala has a built-in ordering type class that has defined instances for ints, longs, floats, other types that don't have a comparison function built into the class, but is inherently comparable. And defining these types for ordering adds in that comparison functionality outside the scope of that class after the fact. And that's the real power of type classes, is that anyone can come along and add their own definitions to achieve the same functionality for any type. So let's take that ordering example and recreate it here. Uh, and this is going to be the long form example we'll be following for the rest of, uh, rest of the presentation. So we have, uh, you know, a trait my ordering that has a compare function that takes an x and a y of whatever type. And let's just say that uh, if x is less than y, you're going to return a negative number. If x is equal to y, you return zero. And if x is greater than y, return a positive number. So what that might look like for, say, strings um, is, you know, just take the lengths of the strings and subtract them. Pretty straightforward. And then for ints, of course, you just subtract your ints. And the way that you might use this type class is you ask for the type class implicitly with the given type that you care about, and then you just call the compare function. With, and that's uh, all you got to do. Okay, so now that we've combined implicit values in type classes, let's take it a step up and combine implicit functions with type classes. And the thing to look for here is that we actually pass implicit values to these implicit functions, all of which gets picked up implicitly. Okay, so the way we're going to use these implicit functions is for container type classes. And all that means is a type class for just an option, list, vector, etc. Anything that takes that type T that is actually the value we care about that the container simply holds. So let's look at an option specifically as an example. First off, let's look at the function declaration. It's an implicit function and it implicitly asks for the my ordering instance of the underlying type T. So that way we have a means of comparing the type that we really care about and now we just need to build the mechanics specific to options, which looks like this. So let's just say that for options, if both options being compared are sum, then rely on that my ordering t to compare those inner values. If both options are none, then just their equivalent returns zero. And if one is none and the other is sum, then let's say none is less than sum, which is what those last two lines show. Okay, let's take a look at a different type of container, the case class. To quickly cover case classes, it's just a regular class, except it has a focus on the data that's passed into the constructor. So like how option or list have that underlying type T, a case class has underlying types that are the constructor arguments. In this particular case, foo, a string, and an int. Okay, so to compare two specific case classes, let's say that we're going to start with the leftmost argument of the case class and compare that type. If the comparison is not zero, meaning that they're not equal, then simply return that result, we've arrived at an answer. But if it is zero, meaning that the values are equal, then move to the next argument in the list of the constructor. So for foo specifically, compare the v1 strings, and if they're not equal, then return immediately with that result. Otherwise, compare the v2 ints. So let's take a look at how we'd write that type class for a foo. So like with the option type class, it's an implicit function that takes implicit arguments, this time for a my ordering of string and a my ordering of int. 
and the compare function implements what I just described. First, you compare the strings. If the comparison is not zero, return that result. Otherwise, compare the ints. And if you want to use this type class, you just instantiate two instances of foo, implicitly ask for that my ordering of foo, and then just call the compare function and pass in both instances. So that foo type class worked fine, except you'd have to write a new type class for every single case class that you ever write. It's not like the option type class, which will ask for the my ordering of type t, whatever t is. So is there a way to get to that point? And I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have a good answer to that question. And of course, the answer to that question is shapeless. Uh, it's, it's been mentioned before, of course, but um, it's a big library, has a lot of complicated pieces, and hopefully I'll only be looking at one of the easier pieces today, and that is the H list, short for heterogeneous list. It's like a normal list, except it can hold a different arbitrary type for every element without losing type information, meaning it doesn't become an H list of type any. Uh, and the way it does that is by specifying the type for every single element in the type signature. So as you can see for type my hl, it's string cons int cons h nil, where h nil is just the end of the h list. And if you define a value of that type and ask for its head, the type information is retained. So as you might have noticed, this type definition looks pretty similar to a case class, which we'll be taking advantage of that. Because shapeless provides a way to convert between case classes and h lists. First, you instantiate this magical class called generic, telling it the type of your case class. And then this generic class has a to and a from function. To will convert a case class to an H list, and from will convert an H list to a case class. I never remember which one's which, but there's only two, so I get a 50-50 shot whenever I have to use it. All right, so with all these pieces in mind, implicits, type classes, case classes, and H lists, how do we create a type class that works for any case class? So the first step is to support all the underlying base types that we want. Fortunately, we've basically done this part already. This would be making sure you have a my ordering instance for strings, ints, doubles, options, whatever else you want to put in the constructor of your case class. And the second step is the real doozy. It's building an H list equivalent type class of the case class via inductive recursion. Let me explain exactly what that means. So starting off with induction, it's just a mathematical proofing method where you, which uses recursion to de um, define a theorem or just like a method. It involves two steps, which is the base case, the termination of your recursion, and the inductive step, uh, which is the recursive piece of it in this particular case that's going to be like every element in our H list. Um, First, let's start with defining our base case, H nil. Uh, because of the way that we compare case classes, if we've compared all previous elements and found them to be equivalent, that must mean the entire case class is equivalent. And since H nil represents the end of all the elements we're comparing, H nil must mean that the entire case class is equivalent, which makes the definition pretty straightforward. We create our H nil my ordering and the compare function always returns zero. Okay, so let's return to our foo case class and start building up our new method of writing a type class, but we're going to write it first without implicits, and I think this is important because it shows us what the compiler is doing for you and helps dispel a lot of the magic that I sort of ran into when I started using uh, shapeless h lists. Okay, so first we've defined our base case and we'll just alias it so we know what we're talking about. So the next step is the inductive step. Uh, this is the most complicated part of my presentation today, so conceptually, we're going to have two H lists whose type signatures are the same, and we want to compare them. In order to compare them, we're going to pull the heads off of both H lists and run the compare function between those heads. If they're not equal, then we have a result, we can just return that. But if they are equal, then we need to move to the next element of the H list and run the comparison for that. And here's what that code looks like. It's complicated, but let me break it down. And hopefully, I can make it understandable. So first, you'll notice that like the original foo case class, it's an implicit function that takes implicit my orderings, but this time, it also takes type parameters h and t. h is the type of the head of the h list. That would be your int or string or whatever type it is you're going to compare next in the case class. And t is the rest of the h list, i.e. the tail. So as you can see, we ask for a my ordering instance of h, the head, so that we can do a comparison of that head type. And then we ask for a my ordering for t, the tail of the h list. That is the most important part of this entire function because it is the recursive piece. 
TO will actually implicitly call HList ordering this entire function, except with the tail of the current HList, all the way until you get to H nil, at which point it will implicitly ask for that base case, which always returns zero. Uh, and that is the most important piece right there. In fact, in just a minute, we're going to see what that looks like when you don't let the compiler implicitly recurse for you, so you can very clearly see what's going on. Okay, so if you actually look at the class declaration, you'll see we're creating a class of type h cons t. So we're still actually defining the type class for the entire h list. We're just breaking up what it looks like so we can ask for those my ordering instances sanely. Anyway, the compare function is as I described in the previous slide. Pull off the heads of each h list and compare them using h o, the my ordering of h, and if the result is not zero, not equal, then simply return that, we're done. Otherwise, compare the tails of the H list, which again, will recursively call this exact same function until the comparison is not zero or it reaches H nil. So back to foo, and hopefully this will help cement some of the concepts we just went over. Let's try to build up this recursive piece, again, without using implicits. And this is exactly what the compiler will figure out for you when you call H list ordering for the entire H list. So first, let's ask for a my ordering in and a my ordering string. Uh, then let's do the first inductive step, which we'll call hList ordering for the right handmost types of the case class, meaning we're going to build up this process in reverse. So the very rightmost type is h nil, the end of the hList, and then the next rightmost type is int. So as you can see, I just pass in int my ordering and then the base case to hList ordering. Uh, that defines our first inductive step. And then the second inductive step takes the next rightmost type, string. And the, previous, and the previous inductive step, which is a type int cons h nil. As you can see, we just pass string my ordering and the first inductive step to that second inductive step. And then this second step is the last one we need to make for foo. But if foo had more arguments, we would just keep adding more inductive steps until we got back to the beginning of the case class. So the last step is creating our hlist instances from two case classes that we actually want to compare. Fortunately, we've already covered this, so it should look pretty familiar. All right, so if you look after that second inductive step, we create, we create a generic instance for foo, and then create hlist representations of foo using that same two method, passing in foo case classes. Uh, and then finally, we can use the second inductive step to compare those two foo hlists. All right, so now that you can see it all written out, it's not pretty, there's a lot of code, Maybe it looks a little more generic, but compared to the way we were originally doing it, it doesn't look great. Both still require a lot of boilerplate, and at least the first method, this way, is easier to understand. But there's one more trick we can use that leverages the compiler to get what we want. Shapeless, as it turns out, can provide instances of that generic foo implicitly, meaning we can write a function that will implicitly convert a case class to its hlist representation, and then run that comparison for the hlist generated. And that looks like this. Like before, let's break down all the pieces and hopefully some of it should look a little familiar from our inductive step. So first, as before, it's an implicit function taking implicit parameters. The type parameters this time are cc, which is the type of the case class that we want to convert to an hlist, and hl, which is the hlist we are converting to. This implicit gen is the generic instance that we wanted, which converts the cc to an hl, which is what that aux type is describing. And then finally, we just implicitly ask for the entire my ordering of HL, which will use that inductive process we just defined to create one. Now the definition of compare here is actually pretty straightforward. First, you compare the two case classes to their HList representations, and then call the compare function using the my ordering of HL. So, if we have that case class to HList implicit conversion in scope, all we have to do to create a my ordering instance for the entirety of the foo case class is just ask for one implicitly. It's pretty easy. Uh, now, we could just as easily create one for bar, which I just add right here. And as long as you have a my ordering for double and string bar's constructor arguments, it will automatically generate the entire my ordering instance. And that's the real power of this kind of type class definition. You can write any case class with as many arguments as you want, and the implicit recursive type class will automatically construct the entire definition for you with no extra boilerplate. And remember, that's what the boilerplate would look like if you wanted to create the same thing without using this method. All right, so that ends the technical part of the presentation. Let me just cover a little bit on why I dove into all this. Um, I've been developing a library that wraps over the 
uh, Java Cassandra library to decode and encode tables in Cassandra directly to Scala case classes. So that means you can, be able, you can do inserts, selects, deletes, whatever, using case classes without ever dealing directly with a Cassandra row primitive. So it's open source, so you can take a look, uh, and I hope you do. Um, and just a you know, quick overview, my type classes kind of look like this. I have one for encoders and decoders to this library. I've actually structured a lot of it with inspiration from Certsy, of course, which has its own type class for JSON serialization. Uh, now, my usage in the library does get a little more complicated than what I just went over, because uh, I end up using what's called labeled generic instead of generic, uh, which basically gives me access to the names for every element in the case class as well as their types, so I can actually use those names to access the correct columns in Cassandra. Uh, from, the view of, from the viewpoint of Scala, this is type safe, but it's important to note that there's no way to like cross-reference what types you have recorded in Cassandra, unless if you somehow rig something up during compilation, which doesn't really sound like a very good idea anyway. So you kind of have to watch out for that. You can still get runtime errors this way uh, just based on what your Cassandra table looks like. All right, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, I do uh, have some time so I can go and you know, show you a little bit of what that Cassandra library looks like just so you can sort of see a more real world application of this concept. So that's basically a dependent type. I have heard it mentioned here before, but dot ox basically just means um, generic is, is meant to take a case class and then you know, allow you to create hlist representations of that case class. And so that dot ox pattern allows you to take that inner type that's inside the generic that's defined after you give it the case class and allows you to use it on the upper level. And I mean, there's been a lot, it's, it's not easy to explain Blame just off the cuff, but um, it's, it's just a way to allow that inner type to become an outer type so that you can then use it to implicitly ask for the entire H list my ordering that I had there. Yes, so he, he's asking, um, you know, when he's done this sort of pattern before and there's a lot of things going on at once, sometimes you sort of just run into implicit resolution problems and the compiler really doesn't tell you much more than that. Um, and I actually asked the same question yesterday, uh, I forget when, but basically you kind of have to just start going in and, you know, if, if you've got a case class that's asking for a double, an int, and a string, maybe you start asking for the implicit of your double int and string, and then if your case class has another case class in it, you know, you might start pulling out that one and implicitly asking for it, just to figure out if you can get an actual line number on where the implicit resolution failed. Uh, as I understand it, there might be some better ways to do this later down the line in, with help from the compiler. Um, there's some sort of annotation you can provide that will actually go in and tell you which item in the case class just, you know, out of the box, which would be great, but I don't think that's out yet. So what you're asking is, um, if you were to try to compare two identical, like the same instance of a, say, of a case class, or? Uh, like if two different case classes, yeah. but they have, the, they have the same field, they have the same field. Ah. Uh, would, would, would something here stop that from working? Um, I mean, based on, hold on, let me go back. Okay, so based on this method, um, you only pass in one type for the case class. So if you were to try to generate some sort of comparison between two different case classes, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be an implicit function in scope that would handle that. So in, 
in this case, if you were trying to just compare two case classes, it wouldn't compile. Now, if you convert those case classes to H lists and then try to compare those H lists, of course that will compile. Yes, so whenever you use this, uh, and the question is that uh, that two method from the gen, does it actually allocate um, that entire H list uh, and it's sort of like an intermediary data store and yes it does. So there is a performance cost in doing this um, but in, in cases like this where you're talking about reading from Cassandra or writing to Cassandra, I think usually that step takes way more time and, and effort than just in allocating a few more things. Okay, uh, I can go ahead and show a few pieces of the uh, Cassandra library. And if you'll just give me one minute here. Okay. Here is my thing. Right, so this is documentation for my library and so let's go and take a look at update and uh, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Okay, so for, actually let's go, let's do an insert, that's a little easier. So for an insert, you're just trying to insert new data into your table and let's say that, you know, it's got, your table's got a string and an int and a long. Uh, all you would have to do is you take your session, you call insert on that session, and you give it an insertable, and it automatically can figure out that you want to make an insert statement with these, uh, you know, using the names from the case class, S, I, and L, and then the values that those case classes, uh, the case class had. Um, and then you can just execute, and it, it works as expected. Um, you know, and you've got, you can do the same thing for select where you have a query and you know you can you know select star select everything from the table um, where you know s equals a string and on the on the flip side once you have that once you have that selected piece you can then uh, extract it which I have like down here so, you know, if you've got a row, it's got a string and, oh, let's try this again. Yeah, if you've got a row that's got a string I and L, then um, yeah, you select it and then, so this is what Cassandra, the Java driver would normally have you do. So if you wanted a my row of this type, you would call your row dot get string, dot get int, dot get list, and then you have to do all this extra stuff. Um, but then if you use this library, that just looks like this. And it will automatically go in and do all those operations for you based on the definition of the case class. All right, and that's, that's probably all I've got then.